Good evening. Welcome to MLA's Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. My name is David Brown and I work with the webinar coordinators, Home Sackett. Tonight's webinar is titled Improving Lamb Survival by Reducing Mob Size at Lambing. And this webinar is going to be presented by Amy Lockwood of Murdoch University. For those who are new tonight, which I understand there is a few of you, this control panel is going to be in the right hand side of your screen. I recommend collapsing that control panel using the red button that is available to you there and you can reinstate it with the same button. An important part of tonight's webinar is the questions box. Now that questions box is where you can put all your questions, uh, they'll be logged in chronological order at my end. And at the end of the webinar, Amy has been kind enough to agree to stay around for as long as we need to get all your questions answered. So I really encourage everyone to start putting their questions in at as soon as they may come to mind, and then we can deal with them uh, at the end of the webinar. Next week, uh, on Wednesday, March the 28th, we're hosting another webinar, and that webinar is titled Lime or Not to Lime. And that's going to be delivered by leading pasture production consultants Jim Vergona and Nathan Ferguson of Graminus Consulting. Now, I've been chatting to Jim and Nathan at length about this webinar, and they've been uh, really excited about pulling together uh, the relevant science that's been produced to date and trying to package it up into a, uh, you know, uh, a practical and, and relevant uh, top, uh, presentation for those people who are considering liming or are currently liming in their pasture systems. Tonight's presenter, Amy Lockwood, is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Murdoch University. Amy is also a PhD candidate. Uh, she, Amy recently completed her PhD, which investigated the impacts of mob size and stocking rate at lambing on lamb survival. She currently works as a postdoctoral post research fellow at the Murdoch University and is involved with two new national projects, both funded by MLA. The two projects reducing fetal, uh, the two projects are reducing fetal and lamb loss in young ewes and boosting lamb survival by supplementing ewes with vitamins and minerals. We, Amy is very current with the work uh, that has been presented tonight and we are very lucky to have Amy on board to, to deliver this webinar for us. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome Amy to the webinar. Just give me one second. Good evening, Amy. Can you hear us? I can, yes. Great. You've got the floor and uh, we'll hear you soon. Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. Um, so I've been involved in this lambing density work over the past few years, as David mentioned, um, and it's been quite an exciting um, opportunity for me to be involved in this new research. Um, so the research basically developed from some producer surveys that were run in Victoria a few years ago. Um, so from that, from that data, we found that for each extra 100 ewes in the mob, twin bearing ewes in the mob, survival decreased by 3.5%. Regardless of birth type, we also found for each extra U per hectare of the paddock, lamb survival decreased by 0.7%. So that highlighted an opportunity for us to improve survival of lambs by both reducing mob size and potentially also reducing stocking rate. So that led to our on-farm research sites uh, where we've found so far that reducing mob size by 100 twin bearing ewes improves the survival of twin born lambs by 2%. So tonight we'll go through those two projects and then we'll have a look at the potential economic value of reducing mob size um, by uh, improving lamb survival by reducing mob size. So as I'm sure you're all aware, lamb mortalities represent a major source of reproductive wastage. On average, at least 20% of lambs born will die prior to marking and about 80% of these deaths occur in the first three days of life. 
Nine mortalities are estimated to cost the industry around a billion dollars each year. And we know that the survival of our merino lambs is poorer than our non-merinos, which is related to their lower birth weight and their poorer vigour, along with the poorer maternal behaviours of merino use. And economic modelling has shown that improving the survival of twin-born lambs is the highest priority for the industry in terms of improving reproductive performance. So when it comes to lambing density, why may we get an effect of mob size and stocking rate on lamb survival? So at the time of lambing, ewes can be attracted to birthing fluids and newborn lambs. And that attraction can result in mismothering or cross-fostering of lambs. Um, and potentially you and lamb separations, which we know results in poorer lamb survival. So when we've got a higher mob size, we're obviously going to have more used lambing per day, particularly for our twin bearing mobs, where we're expecting our lambing density or number of lambs born per day is going to be twice as high. And so we're going to have a greater presence of birthing fluids and newborn lambs, which may increase the risk of mismothering and cross fostering and result in ewe and lamb separations and lamb mortality. So as I mentioned, the Best Will Best Lamb program ran a survey um, a few years ago collecting data from producers in southeastern Victoria, which we analysed for the effects of mob size and stocking rate on lamb survival. So we found for each extra 100 twin bearing use in the mop, survival decreased by 3.5%. In our singles, the effect was quite a bit lower. So uh, for each extra 100 single bearing use in the mop, survival decreased by 1.4%. Regardless of birth type, for each extra ewe per hectare of the paddock, lamb survival decreased by 0.7%. So we're particularly interested in that effect of mob size in our twins, given that's uh, given improving the survival of twin born lambs is the priority for the industry. So if we're to take a closer look at that effect of mob size, if we compare that effect to a mob size of 100 compared to 250 twin bearing ewes, that equates to a difference in lamb survival of just over, a difference in lamb mortality, sorry, of just over 5%, or a difference in marking rate of just over 10%. And the relevance here is that the current recommendation to you as producers is that twin bearing you should be lambed at a mob size of between 100 and 250. So as you can see, that represents quite a large range in marking rate and highlights the scope for improving lamb survival by reducing mob size and providing some more um, credible guidelines around recommendations for mob size at lambing. So those um, producer surveys led us to some on-farm research, which was funded by MLA and AWI. So this research is still ongoing. So far, we've performed the study on 60 farms across Southern Australia over the last two years. The research is all in adult twin bearing ewes, and at each farm, we either use merino or non-merino ewes. So we're looking at a two by two design. So essentially we have a high and a low mob size and a high and a low stocking rate. So on each farm, we've got four mobs or four paddocks. So this map just shows you where our research sites have been located over the last two years. So our merino sites are in black and our non-merino sites are in gray. So in terms of data collection, um, the project basically involves two visits onto the farm. The first is just before lambing, so around 140 days after the rams went in, and that's when we allocate the ewes into their four mobs. We also condition score um, a subsample of each of the mobs to determine the average condition score for each mob, and we also assess foo in each of the four paddocks. We then come back at marking. Again, we condition score that subset of ewes, assess foo, and we also count the number of lambs in each mob to determine lamb survival. We've also collected information around the paddock characteristics. So for example, the topography, shape, the number of watering points, and the availability of shelter, and also collected weather data so we can calculate or determine uh, the chill index during lambing. So this table just shows you the average mob size and stocking rate for our high and low um, treatment groups. 
for both our merino and our non-merino breeds. So as you can see, there was really no difference between our breeds. On average, our low mob size was somewhere around 100 ewes and our high mob size around 240 ewes. Our stocking rate was generally between five to six ewes per hectare for the low stocking rate and seven to eight ewes per hectare for the high stocking rate. In terms of condition score and foo, so there was no differences between our three, four treatment groups or our four mobs. On average, the ewes were in good condition at lambing, so generally above a condition score of three. And our foo levels were somewhere around 1,500 kilos on average. So in terms of lamb survival, we found mob size, but not stocking rate influenced the survival of lambs to marking. We also saw merino lambs had poorer survival than our non-merino lambs, which is what we'd expect based on previous research. So if we're to look at that effect of mob size, so we had about just under a 3%, uh, sorry, 3% survival was just under 3% higher at the low mob size compared to the high mob size. And that equates to a decrease in the survival of twins of 2% for each extra 100 twin bearing ewes in the mob at lambing. So the effect is linear. So as we increase mob size, lamb survival is decreasing. So just to recap on our producer surveys and our on-farm research, so we've either seen a very small effect of stocking rate from our producer surveys or no effect of stocking rate on lamb survival, which indicates that reducing stocking rate is probably not going to be an effective strategy for improving lamb survival. We've seen that lower mob sizes equate to higher lamb survival. And for our on-farm research sites, this effect was consistent between our merinos and our non-merinos, and for use in a condition score of between 2.6 and 3.7 at lambing. So this indicates that regardless of breed, if we reduce mob size, we're going to improve lamb survival when ewes are in a reasonable condition at lambing. So as part of my PhD, um, we also performed a couple of experiments in Pindley, which is a couple of, of few hours east of Perth. Um, so we had ewes that were lambing in winter and they were merinos. So in 2016, we had an exceptional season over here in WA. Um, we ended up with food levels of over 2,500 kilos of dry matter per hectare at lambing or throughout lambing. And under those conditions, we saw no effect of mob size on the survival of single or twin-born lambs when mob size was uh, 55 compared to 130 ewes. In comparison, last year we had quite a tough season. Our food levels were less than 400 kilos of dry matter per hectare at lambing, and we were also supplementary feeding the ewes throughout lambing. Under those conditions, we saw the survival of twin-born lambs was significantly higher at a mob size of 55 compared to 210 ewes. So survival was just over 6% higher. And if we're assuming that effect is linear, that equates to a 4% decrease in the survival of twin-born lambs for each extra 100 twin-bearing ewes in the mob. So that effect was greater than what we saw from our on-farm research sites. So it indicates there could be a seasonal variation in the effect of mob size on lamb survival, but we are looking to do some further work um, around mob size versus food levels. So in terms of factors that may influence the benefit of reducing mob size on lamb survival, so obviously pregnancy scanning, so if you're not pregnancy scanning, um, then the ability to prioritise uh, your mob size for your twins, where we expect the greater effect is going to be, um, is going to be limited, and so the benefit may be lower. And it also depends on the proportion of twins that you're scanning. So obviously, the more twins that you've got, the greater the benefit of reducing mob size is going to be. Will also depend on the size of your lambing mobs and obviously the size of your paddocks. So if you've got larger paddocks and you're required to subdivide or put up some temporary fencing in those paddocks, obviously we're going to need more fencing, which will increase uh, the labour costs around that fencing. 
and also the, the availability of smaller paddocks or just the availability of paddocks in general. So for example, if a lot of your paddocks are in crop, um, you may not have quite as much scope for uh, reducing mob size and increasing the number of mobs that you have. Potentially you could lamb onto crops, um, particularly for single bearing ewes which are at lower risk of metabolic disease. There may also be differences between our seasons or different food levels. So in our autumn, autumn lambing mobs or where we've got very low food levels at lambing, the benefit of reducing mob size could be greater. In comparison, when we've got very high feed levels or when we've deferred our pastures or we're lambing ewes late in winter or in spring, the benefit of reducing mob size may not be as great. If you have a split lambing, there's obviously going to be two uh, lots of lambing over the year and so the, the payoff or you may be able to recoup the costs of any fencing uh, quicker than if you've just got the one lambing per year and also whether you're able to use that temporary fencing um, for other purposes outside of the lambing season. The final point is that obviously with our reduced mob size and paddock size, we're also going to improve pasture utilisation. So that will um, improve um, feed utilisation and stocking rate and lead to both an improve, improvement in profit via uh, pasture utilisation along with the improved profit from uh, the additional lambs that, you're, that are surviving to marking. So the project is still ongoing, so we we're not yet to complete the full benefit cost analysis and that will come later in the year once we've completed the remainder of our research sites. But for the purpose of this presentation today, I've put some um, rough estimates around what the potential benefit of reducing mob size could be. So if we're assuming the current price of a lamb is around $120 per head, and fencing, um, depending on whether you're using temporary or electric, temporary electric fencing or whether you're putting in permanent um, ring lock fencing, potentially around four to five dollars per U to subdivide those paddocks. And then obviously there's an additional labour cost in terms of the fencing, which um, is most of that labour cost, as well as some additional mustering and monitoring both at the time of, or just before lambing, during lambing, and then when you bring the use, uh, use and lambs in, and again for marking. And based on some economic modelling performed by John Young, um, the additional cost of the lamb is estimated to be around $20 per head. So keeping those figures in mind, if we're to look at reducing uh, mob size by 100, we're going to increase the number of lambs marked in each of those mobs by four. So if we split a mob of 200 twin bearing ewes into two mobs of 100, we're going to increase marking rate by 4%. Taking into account the cost of those additional lambs, we could assume that that's going to provide an additional $4 per twin bearing ewe but we then need to take into account any additional costs. Um, so fencing, if you do need to subdivide paddocks, um, the additional cost of that fencing may be four to five dollars per year, which means you're probably not going to recoup those costs until um, the second year of lambing. And then there's the additional labour costs. So depending on how much fencing you require, that additional labour cost may be lower um, or it may be higher. So when it comes to allocating ewes to mobs at lambing, we have our lifetime ewe management guidelines, which are for our merinos, but there is current work um, trying to understand whether those are comparable for maternals. So we know that pregnancy scanning uh, and separating our single and twin bearing ewes to optimise condition score and life weight profile will both improve ewe and lamb survival and performance. And those lifetime ewe management guidelines also provide some condition score and food targets um, for use at lambing and during lactation. There's also some guidelines around uh, paddock characteristics, particularly shelter. So we know that improving um, the availability of shelter for our twin bearing ewes will 
uh, potentially improve lamb survival, but the, the effectiveness of that shelter is probably going to be one of the main factors determining whether or not um, shelter will impact on survival and obviously also whether or not the user utilising that shelter. And from our current work, um, we've indicated that reducing mob size is going to also improve lamb survival. So we would suggest that some new guidelines incorporating both the condition score targets with reducing mob size is going to improve uh, lamb survival. So the key messages from our work Obviously, pregnancy scanning and optimising new condition score will improve lamb survival. And if we also reduce mob size at lambing, we're going to improve marking rates. So the effect of mob size appears to be about um, the same as increasing condition score for use at lambing by 0.1 to 0.2. So it's a fairly small effect, but when used in combination with our existing guidelines and some developing new guidelines, we're likely to develop those um, improvements in marking rate. Thank you. Well, that's excellent, Amy. Thank you very much uh, for giving us an outline of your work there and some very interesting results, which no doubt uh, the audience tonight will, will um, be thankful that they're, they're the wiser for attending. Now, Amy, I'll just give you a a minute break there to grab your breath. There's a lot of questions rolling in here, so we'll get to them in a minute. I just want to remind the audience that uh, next week we're going to be hearing from Jim um, uh, Jim Fagona and Nathan Ferguson of Graminus Consulting on whether we should be liming uh, to increase partial production. And they're going to be looking at some of the uh, production and economics of liming based on a uh, a review of some of the best literature um, or, or, or uh, of the most robust literature that's been uh, produced to date on that subject. Uh, the week after that, we're also going to be touching on the use of urea and gibberellic acid in pastures. So, and that's going to be delivered by a, a very, a very uh, well-versed pasture agronomist in Tasmania, Basil Doonan. So we're looking forward to hearing from Basil, nitrogen, and gibberellic acid in pastures. Now, a few of you may need to duck off this evening. Don't forget to tag a few comments, um, positive and negative, on, and any criticism that was improved the webinars in the post-webinar survey. Uh, and also, I'd like to encourage everyone, this is your uh, levies in action. So if you have friends, family, co-workers that could benefit from attending the MLA webinars, I really would encourage you to put them in touch with me. I'll provide them the registration link or forward them the registration link that, uh, that you've used to register yourself. So I really would encourage everyone to uh, spread the word about the webinars and make sure that everyone who you know, are paying MLA levies uh, has provided the opportunity to, uh, to participate in, in them. Okay, so Amy, there's a few good questions coming through here. A few of them may have come uh, a little early and, and have been answered throughout the um, webinar, but there are also some other good ones here that will require some of your attention. So are you ready to get stuck in? Absolutely. Great. Uh, so Georgia, you asked the question, is this all based on Merino data? I, th I think we've uh, covered, we've seen that it is, it's uh, based on both uh, crossbred uh, and, and merino data. Um, now, first question for you, Amy, is a, is a good question from Bruce. Uh, Bruce has um, made a, gave some context to the question. Uh, his, his question is, does topography have effect, have an effect uh, in, within the paddocks, my understanding is that in the Evergrey's work, differences seen at Hamilton were not replicated at Tarkata, and a combination of topography and climate were considered to be the difference. Were the results? Uh, so that's the first part of the question. Have you? Uh, do you have a, a comment there, Amy? Yes, so um, we did record topography, as I mentioned, and also chill index. So both topography and chill index had no interaction with mob size. So that meant that uh, the effect of mob size was 
consistent across the paddocks um, that we had in the study. Most of our paddocks were um, sort of flat to undulating, so we didn't have any particularly steep paddocks. Um, so in those steeper paddocks, potentially the effect of mob size may be greater because we're going to get a concentration of ewes and birth sites, which may amplify that um, mismothering and cross-fostering effect. Um, and again, the effect of chill index wasn't um, didn't interact with mob size, so it indicates that regardless of chill index um, and the shelter availability, the effect of mob size will be consistent. Just to qualify, Amy, was the chill index analysed uh, over the entire duration of the lambing period or at any one point, maybe at the start of the lambing period? Yeah, so chill index was an average throughout the period uh, throughout the lambing period. So obviously there may have been days where there was quite a high risk of, of, of lambs dying from chill index. On average, the chill index didn't exceed um, the critical threshold, which above um, which lamb survival is highly, heavily compromised. So it was fairly representative of winter spring lambing across southern Australia um, and didn't present a, a, a huge risk in terms of lamb mortality. Okay, great. Bruce has also got another question here. Um, it is, do you get the same effect by adding singles in with the twin bearing ewes and working out the number of lambs being born? And this is could be to cope with the paddock, uh, paddock size limitations on farm. For instance, uh, if you have uh, 100 twin bearing ewes, uh, will that be the same as 60 twin bearing ewes and 80 singles, uh, i.e. 140 ewes. The ewes are separated at Scanian box back into the point of lambing. Yeah, that's a good question and it's one that's come up um, across several field presentations um, and it's something we have thought about. So there hasn't been any experimental work into the effect of combined mobs of singles and twins um, on lamb survival. It could be assumed that um, it's going to come down to lambing density, so the number of lambs born per day, in which case that theory could, um, could be true. I guess the only thing in terms of mixing our singles and twins is that we may be compromising survival um, by not having the ewes in their optimum conditions. So that potentially could be a strategy for our later lambs or where we've got higher food levels where nutrition is probably not going to be compromised but um, for example, earlier lambers or when we've got low food levels, mixing of singles and twins may actually present a, a, an additional risk of, of lamb mortality. Great, that's a great answer. Thank you, Amy. Amy, there's a question here from Neil. Neil asks, have self feeders been used in any of these trials? If so, are there any benefits or is it detrimental to mismothering and, and to, you know, to uh, and, and, and deaths? Yeah, that's another great question. So we didn't use cell feeders in this experiment um, around the fact that we don't really know um, whether or not cell feeders encourage lamb mortality. There's a bit of um, varying opinion out there and there hasn't been any actual experimental work to validate whether cell feeders or trail feeding is more detrimental to lamb survival. Um, uh, you could really argue either way, but it indicates from our from our, my PhD work um, potentially supplementary feeding. I would imagine probably more by trial feeding because you've, you're getting that dis disturbance factor that there may be an increased risk of mismothering, particularly in our higher mob sizes where we've got more lambs, more newborn lambs on the ground. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Amy, a, a question from Simon. Um, it may be a little bit more complicated uh, than, the, than the simple question uh, suggests, but he asks, am I better spending money on fencing rather than preg testing? I would definitely say preg, preg testing should be your number one priority. Um, obviously, managing your singles and twins is going to be uh, the greatest priority in terms of optimising condition score and live weight, which is going to come down to pregnancy scanning. So I definitely wouldn't say that 
um, I'd go ahead and, and start subdividing your paddocks without scanning first. I would say this is something that would come after you've scanned and it's, I guess the mob size work is um, focused around achieving those extra sort of two to three percent increases in survival. So we know that preg scanning and optimising condition score and live weight is going to improve lamb survival quite significantly and that's where most of our um, guidelines focus. Um, but at this this mob size work indicates that some additional improvements in lamb survival can be achieved by reducing mob size and potentially subdividing paddocks. Thanks, Amy. Philip asks, was lamb predation recorded or factored into the trial work? And Philip suggests that uh, predation is normally higher in 20 mobs. Uh, we didn't record anything around predation, um, so I, I can't really provide too much of an answer on that. We didn't do lambing rounds or collect any um, lambs for autopsy, so um, yeah, I can't really comment too much around uh, around the effect of predation on our on our results. No worries, Amy. Um, Amy Ken asks, what do you think about running smaller mobs for lambing than boxing mobs back together after lambing? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I guess most of our our lamb survival or lamb mortality is coming in those first three days after life, when uh, sorry after birth, when the um, risk of mismothering and cross fostering is going to be greatest. So um, when we when we get to marking, most of our lambs are likely to survive from that point on. So I would definitely say lambing lambing the ewes in smaller mobs and then boxing them up after marking is definitely um, a good strategy. Amy, a good follow-on for that question is a question here from Peter. Peter asks, how long should ewes and lambs be kept in the smaller mobs post the lambing period? Um, that's a good question. I would suggest probably at least a week, given that um, you know, the, the ewe lamb bond takes at least a couple of days to fully develop and the risk of, of ewe lamb separations is going to be lower um, once the lambs are about, you know, a few days to a week of age. So I guess, yeah, boxing your, boxing your mobs back up after a week after your last lambs dropped is probably not going to compromise survival. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Amy. Amy, sometimes you, webinars can be a bit thankless because you don't get the feedback from the audience, but you've had <laughs> some congratulations here from Graham. He said, excellent presentation and well done. So you've uh, had some positive <laughs> feedback already. <laughs> Excellent. A question here from Neil, Amy, how important is adequate food resources, e.g. energy and protein requirements for ewes to maintain adequate milk production? Um, yeah, so lactation is obviously a, um, a, a very important period in terms of, of the ewes nutritional requirements and important for lamb growth and survival. So protein requirements in particular and energy as well are very um, our highest during lactation. So meeting those requirements is going to be important in terms of um, you and lamb survival and performance. Amy, a question here that was inevitable. Um, hi Amy, this is from Justin. Is there any data around bigger numbers, um, maybe a thousand singles versus 500 singles or a thousand twin bearing ewes versus 500 twin bearing ewes or even bigger numbers? Yep, so as part of the project, we're also collecting network data. Um, so that will capture some of those larger landing mobs and we'll be able to analyse that data um, in a similar way that we've analysed our experimental data. Um, and we've also seen some, some larger lambing mobs from our earlier survey work. Um, there's also some new um, work that's just starting to develop around looking at um, larger lambing mobs in our sort of lower rainfall zones, which will investigate whether the effect of mob size is um, similar in those larger lambing mobs. Given that the effect or the relationship between mob size and lamb survival is linear, we would definitely expect that um, we're still going to improve survival by reducing mob size with our larger mobs. Um, but obviously the practical um, practicality around reducing mob size and subdividing our larger lambing paddocks is probably not um, 
as easy as our as our smaller mobs. So ma managing those larger mobs um, may be a little bit more challenging. Great, Amy. Thank you. Amy, a question here from Casey. Uh, Casey says, uh, we are drift lammers, moving ewes and mobs of a 300 uh, and then putting ewes that have lambs into mobs of around 100 to 150 ewes. Uh, Casey loses less than 10% of the fetuses and she asks, how can she apply uh, this research to their instance? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, so I guess um, reducing the number of newborn lambs in the mob is probably going to improve survival by reducing the risk of, of mismothering and cross-fostering be because ewes are going to be attracted to um, newborn newborn lambs. So I guess the smaller, smaller mobs, um, lesser ewes in the mob um, will still improve lamp survival but that, yeah that's an interesting um an interesting point um and probably one i need to put a bit more thought into no worries amy amy a question here from charles uh, charles asks if you don't want to do the fencing are you able to put the ewes uh, with cows to decrease the mob size of ewes at lambing um i would yeah, well, I can see why not. I guess the the cows aren't going to disturb the ewes in terms of um, lambing behaviour. It's going to be more the attraction between the lambing ewes. Um, I guess another option is to potentially increase the size of your single bearing mobs, given that we know well, the effect of mob size is likely to be lower in our singles. So we could um, potentially increase the survival, sorry, the size of our single bearing mobs and reduce the size of our twin bearing mobs. Um, and potentially also lambing onto crops could be another option. But yes, I would I would, would imagine that mixing with cattle is probably another option as well. Okay, no worries. Thank you, Amy. Amy, a question here from Oliver. Uh, we may have touched on this and if we need to come back to it later, we can. Uh, Oliver, well, we've actually got this earmarked as a as a webinar topic in itself, so there's a chance that we'll um, be able to sort it out in more detail. But if is uh, if if we need to supplement your feed during lambing, do self feeders have a higher survival rate than trial trial feeding? Yeah, so I guess that as far as I'm aware, there has been no experimental work around um, whether trail feeding or using self feeders is um, more detrimental in terms of lamb survival. Um, you could look at it from either way. I guess with trail feeding, there's potentially an increased risk of disturbance of, of newly born lambs, which may increase the risk of mismothering or cross fostering of lambs. Um, and then with our self feeders, potentially if the ewes are hungry, they may leave behind their newborn lambs. Um, and particularly with our twins, which are poor at following the ewe, we may get increased mortality. So I'm not too sure, um, to be honest, around what the differences between self-feeders and, and, and trail feeding is, but um, it is something that I would like to know as well. Great. Thanks, Amy. Amy, a good question here, uh, thinking laterally across the ditch. Is there any evidence from New Zealand research that mob size has an impact on lamb marking percentages? Yeah, so that's an interesting point. And I actually did a little bit of work over in New Zealand as part of my PhD. So we ran some surveys very similar to the best, wool, best lamb surveys that were run in Victoria over on the South Island of New Zealand. And we saw there was an effective mob size on lamb survival, but only in the merinos and not in the maternals. Um, we did have quite a, a limited number of producers in that survey. Um, and we didn't see any significant effect of stocking rate. So uh, the effect of mob size appears to still be there in New Zealand, um, but potentially maybe more evident in our merinos. Great. Thanks, Amy. Amy, if you can't, um, question here from Georgia, if we can't split into the smaller mobs, uh, which are unrealistic mob sizes for most, um, Georgie suggests, should producers 
bother scanning for singles and twins or just wet and dry or run them separately for feeding and then together for lambing. I would definitely recommend that you're still scanning for singles and twins given that um, most of our improvement in lamb survival comes around whether or not we can optimise the condition score and life weight profile of ewes during lambing, or during pregnancy and during lactation. So scanning for singles and twins would be priority number one. Um, and then mob size would come after that. So you may not be able to land use in mobs as small as what, for example, that the um, experimental work I've presented today, but still reducing mob size um, by some degree is likely to achieve an additional, you know, one to two percent increase in, in lamb survival, at least depending on what the seasonal conditions are like. So definitely I would be scanning for singles and twins and prioritising um, nutrition towards our twin bearing use. Amy, question from Melanie. Isn't uh, she asks, is splitting ewes at 140 days um, post ram, i.e., 10 days before they're due to uh, give birth, is that too late uh, to be yarding and, and messing around and splitting the ewes up into their mobs? So a lot of our research work involves handling ewes um, at day 140, so just before lambing. Um, and we haven't seen any increase in the risk of metabolic disease um, as a result of that yard, yarding and mustering. So um, based on based on our work, I would say no, but I guess it needs to be something you're comfortable with. You don't need to um, necessarily split them at day 140. You might want to split them earlier, um, but then I guess it's just about matching them to um, the, the amount of feed that you have available. So I guess allocating them to, to those paddocks as close to lambing as possible will um, optimise the amount of feed that they've got um, through the pasture during, during the lambing period. Great. Thanks, Amy. Doing a great job answering these questions and there's still a fair few to come. So that generally means that you're you're doing a good job and people are willing to send them in. So question here from Steve. I think we may have already covered this, Steve, but I'll just confirm with Amy. Uh, Steve asks, at what age could you box mobs back together into larger mobs? Did you say you recommended one week after or, you know, post uh, the lambing period, Amy? Yeah, so I, most of um, our work has involved, you know, marking or boxing mobs back together about a week after the last lambs drop. So I guess after about a week, you're going to have a reduced risk of mismothering um, associated with that early, early neonatal period. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say a week. I'm not sure if there's any other um, recommendations out there. Thanks, Amy. Amy, is uh, someone wants your opinion. Um, can you tell me the national uh, average for lamb survival? Um, hang on, excuse me, I'll just re rephrase that. Can you tell me whether the national average of lamb survival and use of 150% is acceptable? Uh, Larry would like your opinion. Um, they don't think that's an acceptable uh, level of lamb survival. So, and I should put that in context, so 150% uh, marking rate would be a, two, a 75% yeah. uh, survival rate. Yeah, so I guess there's a lot of variation around um, lamb survival rates, uh, given variation in season um, and in, in various factors, weather conditions at lambing, food availability. So 75% is probably where we're at on average um, and we would like to improve that um, as much as we can. So from our research um, across across southern Australia with this mob size work, average survival was around 75%, um, can be lower, um, particularly in our merinos and generally a bit higher in our maternals. So 75% might be our starting point, but obviously we do want to improve above that and aim for sort of at least 80%. Great, thanks Amy. 
Uh, Amy, if Fu, uh, this is from Peter. If Fu needs to be uh, needs to be supplemented, that's food on offer needs to be supplemented. Is there research on how uh, mode of delivery of grain and hay may affect mismothering? I think that we've covered this. Uh, this would be uh, we've already covered this, haven't we, Amy? Yeah. Yes, we have. Um, yeah. Okay, that's okay. So Peter, we the, um, there seems to be a lot of interest around this subject and. We, uh, MLA webinars, will attempt to find any research or sound opinion and we'll find that person and, and try and drum up a webinar. So keep your ears peeled and we'll um, let you know when that's on. Now, a good question from Jonathan that's uh, probably um, focused on the, the outcomes of your trial work a bit more. Do you have different optimum size for mobs of merinos versus maternals um, for lamb survival? So in terms of actual optimum um, mob sizes, we haven't really come up with any guidelines as such. And once we have completed the rest of our research sites, we will be coming up with some guidelines around um, reducing mob size to improve lamb survival. So basically all of our work has shown the smaller mob size, well, as you get smaller in terms of mob size, survival increases. So um, reducing mob size by 100 years is going to improve survival by 2%. So it doesn't really matter where you're starting in terms of um, you may be starting at 400 years, you may be starting at 200 years. Reducing your mob size will improve survival. Um, I think that answered the question. I've forgotten the rest of the, the question, sorry. No, I think that's I think that's on the money, Amy. I think that's fine. Another question here from Charles. Charles asks, is there any differences in uh, lambs uh, lamb marking when comparing shorn ewes versus not shorn? And is it true that if you take the bellies off ewes, they mother better? Um, an interesting point and something that I'm probably not um, – too well versed on. Um, I guess shearing has um, presented some variation in terms of lamb survival. There is some indication that shearing used before lambing may encourage them to sh seek shelter, um, which would obviously optimise uh, or increase the likelihood of lamb survival by um, reducing the chill index particularly in our in our areas where we've got a high, high chill index at lambing um, and I guess taking off the belly they're going to be closer to the ground so um, yeah something I'm not uh, probably too well qualified to answer but there is some variation in terms of the effect of shearing on on lamb survival. Thanks Amy. Uh, if I may hazard to to uh, contribute here as well Charles that there is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there has been research done looking at shearing time um, you know, before lambing and its effect on um, lamb survival. And it is all focused around the ewes seeking shelter. And the best, uh, the best research I could see was that anywhere beyond, uh, if lambing is anywhere beyond six weeks off the board, then there is absolutely no uh, you know, increased incidence of the ewe seeking shelter. Um, but if they're shorn, you know, obviously within that six-week period, there's a gradual increase in propensity of the ewe to seek shelter. Um, you know, obviously with a with a with a with a less wool on their back. So there is an effect. Uh, you know, there is a small effect there. But obviously they need the shelter, and then then they need the poor weather to um to to generate that effect. Um, look. There's a good question here um, by Glenn. Uh, Glenn asks, were the mobs in the experiment checked daily for lambing problems or is there any data on whether it is better to stay out of twin lambing mobs rather than risking mismothering by disturbing them? That's from Glenn. So the use in um, our experiment were all managed as per normal practice for the farm. Um, so typically use were monitored at least a couple of times a week for, um, for lambing issues. Some people prefer to monitor them more regularly. Some people prefer not to, not to disturb them at all. Um, I'm not aware of any experimental um, evidence to indicate that uh, monitoring 
can increase the risk of mortality, but obviously disturbing ewes um, close, to, close to the time of lambing, either during the lambing process itself or just after the ewes have lambed, um, can increase the risk of uh, ewe and lamb separation or mismothering and uh, lamb mortality. Amy, Rhonda asks, can you comment on trace element and calcium leak supplementation and its effect on lamb survival? Um, that's not something I have too much experience in myself. Um, there has been some work done recently on in terms of uh, supplementing use with calcium um, in terms of risk of metabolic disease. Um, but to be honest, I'm not too sure in, in terms of what the um, recommendation would be in terms of, of supplementation. No, great. Thanks, Amy. That's fine. Um, good question from Mal. Uh, Mal asks, were there any maiden ewes in this particular research? And do you think that maidens should lamb separately to older ewes? So all of the ewes in our on-farm research were adult ewes. Um, in the survey work, we did have a mixture of maiden and adult ewes. Um, we didn't see that the effect of mob size on survival differed between our maiden or our adult ewes, which um, suggests that maybe the effect will be consistent. Obviously, in our um, maiden ewes, we have an increased risk of poorer behaviour because they're not primed. Um, to react to their lambs and so they, they can often have poor survival rates. Um, mixing adult ewes with, with maiden ewes could potentially um, increase their, their, or decrease their negative behaviours which may improve survival. Um, in terms of mob size uh, though, I'm, yeah, we, we would need a bit more further work around whether or not we, we manage our single, uh, sorry, our maiden use separately to our adults and whether reducing mob size is going to have the same effect. Okay, perfect, thanks. Thank you, Amy. Uh, a comment here from Justin, I think for the benefit of us and, and for the audience, Amy, uh, no answer required. From experience, Justin suggests that boxing mobs gently before marking is better than boxing the day of lamb marking, yeah. meaning that there's less mismothering. So thanks for that, Justin. Now, there's, there's, there's actually two questions here, Amy, that I think we've already covered. The first one's from Ken. Uh, would you suggest a, a, a mineral or vitamin block during lambing and what kind? Uh, so, Amy, I think we've just talked to that issue that you're probably not, um, uh, you haven't got anything uh, you know, uh, to contribute in that space at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the next one is from Bob. Is there any evidence that lambing maidens and older years reduces lamb losses? So you've just covered that then. So thanks, Bob. Um, a question here from Jonathan. Have you any thoughts on drift lambing in particular? Um, and Jonathan has also heard that lambing, uh, 20 lambs burn por born per day is optimum for survival. So two parts of that, have, what's your thoughts on drift lambing, uh, if you're familiar with the subject, uh, with the topic, and is there any comment around that 20 lambs born per day uh, for optimising lamb survival? Yeah, so I think the, the question around drift lambing was one similar to um, an earlier question. Um, I guess potentially there is an in increased risk of, of mismothering um, when we're drift lambing, if we're disturbing recently lambed ewes. Um, however, if they're sort of, you know, haven't recently lambed, then drift lambing is probably not going to present a huge risk. Um, in terms of the lambs per day, I'm not really aware of any recommendations um, that are supported by credible um, evidence. Um, there's some, some previous studies have suggested stocking rates of sort of 11 to 18 ewes per hectare will uh, present a decreased risk of, of cross-fostering and, and errors in terms of pedigree records. Um, in terms of the 20 lambs per day, um, I suppose you could put that down to sort of 10 twin-bearing ewes lambing per day, um, which, may be, which may be reasonable. Um, I guess as, as 
as we decrease the number of lambs born per day, we're going to improve lamb survival. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure where that 20 lambs per day has come from, but obviously reducing the number of lambs born per day will improve uh, the survival, particularly for twins. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Um, this topic's really sparked some interest. We've got some co more comments here and a few more good questions. Um, and also, um, yeah, so here we go from Melanie. Thanks, Melanie, for your input. Uh, she's provided all, us all a tip from her experience, tip for boxing use post lambing. Take to a new paddock as separate mobs before you box them. Don't try to box as a mark as marking tark takes place because this causes major mismothering and rejection. If taken as mobs to a new paddock and let, let them box up there at their own pace, it seems to be okay. So thanks for the input, Melanie, much appreciated. Um, um, Rhonda, we've covered the uh, mixing the maidens with the older ewes. Uh, Bruce has got back uh, to us with a with a uh, recommendation around uh, the cows, uh, mixing cows and lambing ewes. He's he's actually said don't put the ewes with the cows. I suggest that would be from, um, uh, I suggest that's some uh, experience that Bruce has had. And that's actually been reiterated by Melanie as well, that she said that cows will disturb the lambing ewes um, especially if there's if there, if there's calves in the mob of cows. So, uh, look, I think we might just have to take that on notice, Amy, that mixing the cows with the um, uh, with the ewes to to spread out that lambing, or you know, to allow us to lamb down in smaller mobs, and maybe something we need to consider a little bit more closer, and the audience needs to consider a bit more before they uh, rush out and do it. Would you recommend? Absolutely. And I, sorry, I should have probably said earlier that I would expect those cattle would have been dry. So I guess, yes, if they are calving, then that's going to probably not be ideal. Okay, right. Yeah. Charles suggests I shouldn't be taking questions from Ollie. <laughs> we don't discriminate here, Charles. Um, you, uh, there's a, Wall has a good question. You've provided the difference between mob sizes. What were the absolute levels of twin survival in the different treatments. Um, yes, have you got an answer there, Amy? Um, so the survival of, of lambs across our treatments so it was about 75%, I think, for our merinos and uh, around 80% for our maternals and about 2% lower in our, sorry, 2.8% lower in our high mob sizes compared to our low mob sizes. So that was the, the table I presented um, earlier. Um, so we could go back to that table if you like. So th these are the absolute um, levels across our treatment. So the, the high and the low mob size is our two mob sizes. So the, the high mob size with the low stocking rate and the high mob size with the high stocking rate. So that's the average of those two treatment groups. And then our low mob size is the average of the low mob size at the high stocking rate and the low mob size at the low stocking rate. This is across our breeds because we had um, no interaction or, or, or the effect of mob size wasn't influenced by breeds. So as you can see, we had better survival in our maternal ewes or our non-merinos non compared to our merinos. So just to qualify, Amy, so that what that's actually telling us is that there were 60 trial sites and each trial site had four paddocks. Uh, um, is that correct, yeah? Yes, that's correct. And and then, but uh, you had about half, half, it was roughly half merino, half prime lamb, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yep. Yeah, so so the 70% the survival in the merinos and the 81% survival on the non-merinos is a pretty robust figure um, based on roughly 30 flocks each. Would that be about right? Yes, so that's so that that seventy point four is the average of our sort of um, thirty farms. So thirty four mobs on those thirty farms, so roughly one hundred and twenty mobs for each of those um, two breeds. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pushy on. Doing a really good job, Amy. The questions are coming thick and fast here. So um, we'll, we'll, we know that you're in Western Australia, so uh, we'll be able to keep <laughs> as long as we can. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, there's been a good comment here from Peter. Thanks, Peter. Self-feed is a far better for lamb survival, so long as there's enough space and the paddock location is spread to reduce distance time away from the lambs. So thanks for that, Peter. Um, Charles has got a good question for you here, a bit left field, but does Amy have any view on lamb survival and pain relief? Amy? Um, in terms of pain relief, I'm not sure what timing of, of the pain relief you're questioning there, if it's around the time of marking or if it's um, at the time of birth. Um, in terms of marking, I guess there, there are pain relief available in terms of you know, trisolvin and there's also new new products coming on the market in terms of, of mulesing pain relief. Um, but I guess most of our lambs are going to survive till, till marking anyway and we're not going to have too many losses after marking. So I'm not too sure about um, when when you're talking about in terms of uh, providing that pain relief. Yeah, Charles does mean at, at mulesing time at lamb marking. At mulesing. Yeah. No. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not too aware of any yeah effects on on survival. I wouldn't imagine they'd be they'd be too significant. No worries. That's that's a it's a fair question, and um, it might be something if we had a if it was a merino focus, it would be definitely something we'd need to be uh, teasing out. I, I suspect um, around the, around the mules. Now, Amy, um, uh, great. Uh, you've been very clear, and with you've answered your question with great detail and that's from Peter keep up the good work so thanks Peter for the positive uh, feedback uh, Casey asks uh, another question here did Amy say that we should target greater than 70% survival of fetuses trial work was at 75% uh, so this is this is survival of in this table here, we've got survival. So 70% is our survival rate. If we want to look at marking rate, we're looking at doubling that. So on average, um, our, our marking rate was around 150%. So this is out of every 100 ewes, for example, in our high mob size, we had 70, just over 74 lambs survive per 100. Um, so uh, yeah, survival was, marking rate, sorry, was around 150% in this, in this work. Okay, no worries. Thanks for that, Amy. Um, now, Bruce has contributed uh, as well here. Um, thanks, Bruce. It's, uh, it's appreciated. Bruce has just commented on the question around the effect of shearing the belly off. Charles, this will be of interest. Um, now, Bruce, Bruce doesn't suggest that shearing the belly off has any effect. Um, and the problem is shearing and the point of lambing has real health issues in many cases. So thanks for that, Bruce. Bruce has just highlighted that uh, there seems to be no real benefit of shearing the belly off. And, um, you know, shearing close to lambing can raise health issues, uh, uh, no doubt, if it, uh, no doubt. Um, a good question here from Kate. Uh, Kate asks of you, Amy, if you mark lambs at about one week of age, can that be an issue? We drift ewes and lambs off the main mob at lambing and then mark them a week later for management purposes. That's from Kate. Um, I wouldn't say that marking them a week after birth is probably going to present a huge risk in terms of lamb mortality. Um, if it was happening sort of within two to three days of birth, I would say in that case, yes, because the um, you and lamb are still sort of developing a, a strong mutual bond. Um, but after a week, they should be fairly well bonded and that risk of, of you and lamb separation is going to be lower. Okay, thank you. Another question here from Peter, Amy, is shearing, uh, if shearing, Peter, I think, I think this question's probably um, might not be in, in uh, uh, you know, within the topic this evening. It's about lice control. Um, we might just uh, move on. There's quite a few questions here and um, I think we'll need to deal with that at a later, at a later date. Uh, Bruce, Bruce says, oh, Sean, Sean McGrath is doing some work on calcium. Um, uh, it could be a good, good topic to cover. 
yeah, I know Sean, uh, Bruce, and I'll be in touch with him to see if it's and uh, and you've suggested there's no clear outcomes uh, at the moment, so I might be in touch with Sean to see where that's at. Um, a question here from Gerald: Has there been any research done, Amy, on any differences between lambing at different times of the year, autumn versus spring, in relation to mob sides? Yeah, so I guess most of our um, research sites were later in 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 winter um, and into spring. So I guess most of our experimental work is during that period, and we don't have a lot around our autumn lammers. Um, as I mentioned, one of my PhD um, experiments was looking at um, that that difference in food, which we suggest that maybe in our autumn lambing mobs or when we've got very low food levels or where we're supplementary feeding, the effect of mob size may be greater. Um, but in terms of the experimental evidence, we don't have too much um, in terms of autumn lambers at the moment. Um, but again, we are collecting that, that network data so that will capture some autumn lambing mobs which we'll be able to look at where the time of lambing is influencing the effect of mob size. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Amy. That's really good. Now, a little bit more positive feedback for you. Matthew says, Amy is really well across this subject. Fantastic presentation. Thank you from Matthew. So good on you, Matthew, for providing that positive feedback. And uh, that'll, that'll buoy Amy on to cover these last <laughs> dozen questions uh, as best she can, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amy, question here from Steve again. Uh, how long was the lambing period in these trials? Um, so most of our uh, sites had sort of had an average 35 day um, joining period. So lambing was over sort of um, six weeks. Um, and some of our some of our mobs may have been a bit longer than that. Um, so so on average, there was sort of what we what we would normally see on on most of our farms is that 34, 35 day joining period. So sort of a six to eight week um, lambing period. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Six to eight weeks. Uh, now, this question from Jock is something that uh, I've come across before, Amy. I'll be interested in your opinion. Um, I've tackled it from a few different angles. Um, now, Jock asks, has there been any research on scanning used into separate cycles, i.e. scanning um, your early and late, your first and second cycles, then allocating these uh, cohorts into mobs for lambing? So I think this will play in uh, to your work uh, a little bit, Amy. What, do you, what are your opinion there? Yeah, so I guess in terms of fetal ageing, um, if we are separating out our earlies compared to our lates, we're obviously going to um, shorten that lambing period, which means that our lambing density could potentially be higher because we're obviously going to have a shorter shorter lambing period and more used lambing during that period. Um, we did actually synchronise um, our use in one of my PhD experiments and we separated out those, well, we, uh, we fetal age the ewes. Um, so obviously with that shorter, shorter lambing period or with AI, you're going to have potentially a higher lambing density. And so in that case, um, lambing use in smaller mobs may be even more beneficial um, compared to when we've got a natural mating where there's going to be fewer lambs, uh, fewer lambs being born over a longer period of time. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um... David David uh, suggests that, um, well done, thanks for the webinar, he's got to go. Um, question here from Matthew, again, any brief comments on the use of drones check use at lambing? <laughs> well, yeah, that's an interesting. Drones. Let's see if Amy can, uh, let's see if Amy can justify it for us. So interestingly, I actually, um, had a Science and Innovation Award funded to look at whether we could use drones to um, both monitor use during lambing and also specifically for my work was to look at whether we could use those drones to measure UN land behaviours remotely um, rather than being in the paddock or nearby the paddock and trying to uh, trying to collect that data. 
Um, so I guess potentially, yes, drones could be useful. Um, the ewes don't seem to react too badly to them, particularly if they're um, given, a, a, you know, 10 minutes or so to acclimatise to the sound of the drone. Um, I guess it really depends on the scale of your enterprise um, and how much ground you need to cover, um, given that the machines that we have available are largely battery powered but definitely a, a new new and upcoming um, a tool that we may be able to use in the next you know few years or so to to look at um, an alternative strategy for mo monitoring which may reduce um, disturbances yeah right yeah perfect thank you amy amy um this might be a, a bit of a doozy but we'll ask it all the same for matt any comments on how this research may be applied to a pastoral zone? Yeah, so um, we will be doing uh, some some work over the next couple of years to look at um, what the effect of mob size is in our lower rainfall regions where we've got high mob sizes and, and lower stocking rates. Given that we don't, um, we haven't seen much enough of effect of stocking rate on lamb survival, um, reducing mob size is probably still going to be beneficial. I guess it just comes down to more of the practical side of reducing mob size under those pastoral conditions um, and whether, you know, reducing mob size and paddock size um, and putting in that additional fencing, particularly in our larger paddocks, is going to be um, practical in, in, the, in the short term um, to, to achieve that long term benefit. Spot on. Thanks, Amy. Um, a few uh, positive comments here. Thanks for Bruce. Great webinar. Thanks. Great webinar from Neil. Great presentation from Sandra. Um, uh, quick question here from Ken. Uh, have you done any work with triplets and have any recommendations regarding triplet mob size? Yeah, so um, a part of our team is also working on some triplet work at the moment funded by MLA to look at um, some, some strategies to improve survival from our triplet bearing use. Um, in terms of the effect of mob size, I would assume it would be very similar, if not greater, to what we've seen in our twins based around um, our assumption that the effect of mob size is driven by the number of lambs being born in the mob per day. So with our triplets, we're obviously going to have even more lambs being born. And so that benefit could be even greater in our, um, in our triplet bearing mobs. Perfect. Thank you for that. Amy, um, um, quick question here from Kate. Uh, I tuned in late. Did you discuss the use of CIDRs to make lambing closer in natural joinings as opposed to a five to six week natural joining? Are you familiar with CIDRs, Amy? Yes, I am. So CIDRs are um, what we use to synchronise our use for joining. So um, a progesterone um, insert. Um, so I guess that comes back to the earlier question we had around um, fetal ageing, which will come into play if we are using cedars. Um, yeah, so I guess when we've got a shorter lambing period and more used lambing over that period, we're potentially going to increase lambing density. And so if you have synchronised your use or you have got an AI program, um, potentially lambing use in smaller mobs may be even more beneficial because we're going to be reducing the number of lambs being born um, during that shorter lambing period. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. Um, quick Quick question from Duncan. I think this may be our last question. So everyone, if uh, if uh, this is the last question, if you've got any other burning questions, this is your chance to ask Amy. Uh, if you don't, thank you so much for attending and, and you're welcome to log off whenever you will. And don't forget that post webinar survey. Be more than happy to receive any uh, positive or constructive feedback there. And don't forget that next week, we're gonna be diving into whether we should be liming our pastures as prime land producers and the week after um, how we can, um, you know, if it is and how we can cost effectively apply gibberellic acid and nitrogen to pastures to boost production. So two pasture orientated webinars over the next two weeks. 
and then we'll be in touch with you after that with upcoming topics and deliverers. Quick question here, Amy, from Duncan. Uh, when does foo override mob size? When does food on offer override the importance of mob size? Uh, so that is a good question and something that I can't really answer at the moment. Um, based on our previous um, work, we have indicated that the effect of mob size is not going to be as great or may not even be significant when we've got very high foo levels. So in our case, foo was above two and a half tonnes per hectare. I'm not sure what the threshold would be in terms of where we um, where we slip from an effective mob size to no effective mob size on different foo levels, but that's definitely something that we would like to look into further. Um, based on, on lamb survival, around you know 1,500 to two tonnes of foo is going to optimise both you and lamb performance and survival. So whether or not it's below that, um, I can't really say at this point. Great, thanks Amy. That seems to have pulled up our questions for this evening. Um, thanks everyone for participating and asking so many questions of Amy. She's obviously very close to the research at the moment uh, and intimate with, her, with, with, how the re with how the trials have been put together and the results. So we've had the right person delivering this evening and she's done a great job. So thank you so much, Amy, um, on behalf of the MLA and, and the participants tonight. And um, we'll, we might make a uh, make a point. You, you may have to do another PhD and sort out these uh, the other issues that have been raised around. You know, um, what were they? Uh, yeah, <laughs> plenty of them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, it's great to get lots of feedback, and um, yeah, it's really great to have such an, such interest in in this area. Yeah, for sure. There's plenty of interest and. Um, I think there's some good work to, to be uh, to be shared pretty soon by the sounds. Now, look, Absolutely. Amy, that, that wraps up the webinar for this evening. That's wrapped up our questions. Um, thank you, for everyone, for attending tonight and being part of the webinar series and supporting what is a hopefully a good use of your MLA funds. Don't forget to leave some feedback and the webinar and to stay uh, to stay on board for the webinar next week. Um, Amy, we'll um, get you that feedback as soon as we can. And uh, and uh, and do you mind if we send out um, the PDF of the presentation to to the audience this evening? No, that should be fine, David. I don't know, dramas. Okay. On behalf of MLA, thank you, and we'll hear you next week. <laughs>